Hello everyone, this lecture is going to be covering the material from chapter 13 of your Merib text, which is the peripheral nervous system. Okay, um, so we've talked about in chapter 11, just the nervous system um, structures, just general overview kind of, um, and then in our previous chapter, chapter 12, we talked about the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and spinal cord. So the peripheral nervous system um, is the last, I guess, division of the nervous system we have to talk about. Um, and the peripheral nervous system provides links from and to the world outside of our body. Okay, so um, in our central nervous system, we talked how about the brain and spinal cord is taking information, integrating it, processing it, um, figuring out, you know, what sensory information is coming in making um, motor information leave, okay? The way that our central nervous system communicates with the rest of our body is through our peripheral nervous system, okay? So it's going to, what, it's, the peripheral nervous system is what's going to allow our brain and spinal cord to commute, communicate with the um, tips of our fingers, tips of our toes, um, etc. Okay, so the PNS consists of all of the neural structures outside of the brain and spinal cord, um, and it can be broken down into four different parts. Um, so sensory receptors um, out in the periphery, right, things that allow us to feel different temperatures, pain, vibrations, so on and so forth. We talked a little bit about these when we talked about the integumentary system. Um, part two would be the transmission lines, so the nerves and their structure. Part three is motor endings and motor activity, um, which you've also already kind of talked about when we talked about the um, muscle physiology. And then part four um, are reflexes. Okay, so we'll talk about all of these in a little bit more detail. Okay, so first of all, I just want to show you again um, this diagram that you've seen before. So central nervous system, CNS, um, remember it was just our brain and spinal cord. Um, so our PNS is everything else. So it's going to be mostly nerves, right? So we'll see cranial and um, spinal <laughs> nerves. Cranial nerves leaving our brain, spinal nerves leaving our spinal cord. Um, the type of information the peripheral nervous system carries, um, there's is a lot. There's a lot of different stuff going on. So we have again sensory information, motor information. Um, and then within the motor information, the efferent division, we have our somatic nervous system as well as our autonomic nervous system. So when we talk about motor stuff today, we're mostly going to be talking about the somatic nervous system. The next chapter, chapter 14, I believe, um, we'll be talking about the autonomic nervous system. Okay, so we'll spend an entire lecture talking about um, the ANS. Okay. All right, so starting by talking about some um, sensory receptors. Again, sensory receptors are going to be the receptors that allow us to feel things. Okay, so the definition, they're specialized to respond to changes in the environment. And those changes we call stimuli. Okay, so anytime you can feel some sort of sensation, there's a stimuli um, that's causing that. And the stimuli is just, again, a change in the environment, whether that's temperature, um, a change in pressure, um, whatever it may be. The stimuli is what's going to be stimulating our sensory receptors. Activation of the sensory receptor is going to most often result in a graded potential. Um, which we talked about in a previous chapter, which is just a small um, change of, you know, internal membrane um, charge, just have, uh, voltage. Um, and if this greater potentials are strong enough, it can trigger a, a nerve impulse, okay? So some things, if they touch you and you can't perceive it, um, you still have... Um, stimulated these sensory receptors, but the stimulation was not strong enough to trigger a nerve impulse to get that information um, actually to your brain. So even if someone touches you really light and you don't really feel it, it's probably still creating a greater potential within that um, sensory receptor. It's just not a great enough stimuli to um, create an actual potential. Okay. 
we have two different, um, I guess there's two different things that we need to talk about when we're talking about, um, you know, these sensory receptors. We have something that's just a, an awareness of the stimulus called sensation, right? So sensation is just your ability to feel um, or be aware that a stimulus is happening. And then we also have perception. And perception is the interpretation of the meaning of the stimulus that occurs within our brain, okay? So we might feel the sensation of something, but the way we are, our brain perceives it kind of depend on um, what we're doing. So if we're, you know... Um, some people, you know, they say they have a big, larger pain threshold than others. So even though two people could fe be feeling the same exact sensation, maybe that sensation is getting a tattoo or something. The way we perceive that painful stimuli of the tattoo, excuse me, that tattoo needle, is going to be different person to person. And it may be even different for each individual person, depending on the day, depending on the environment, depending on you know, um, how much food you ate ahead of time or water you drank. So our perception, um, again, occurs in the brain. It's our way our brain actually processes the sensation information um, and is, again, going to be different depending on the context. Okay. Our sensory receptors can be classified three different ways by the type of stimulus that they respond to the body location um, that they're found, and the structural complexity, okay? So let's start by talking about um, the type of stimulus. Um, so if we're just looking, again, these are classifications by the type of stimulus, okay? So there's a few different types that you're going to have to know. Mechanoreceptors just respond to touch, pressure, Pressure, vibration, and stretch. So like physical physical stuff. Think mechano. <laughs> um, and these receptors actually, um, we'll talk about it later. But they res respond to a physical sensation. Touch, pressure, vibration. Thermoreceptors, the name kind of tells you what they do. They are sensitive to changes in temperature. We have photoreceptors that are responding to light energy. So an example of this um, is our rods and cones. Um, those photoreceptors in the back of our retina, um, they respond to um, light, is how we see light. Chemoreceptors are responding to chemicals. So some examples are these, um, the receptors in our nose that smell, our taste buds, um, would be examples of chemoreceptors. They actually taste um, chemicals. Um, and then, like, our we have different taste buds actually for different um, types of taste. We have sweet, salty, bitter, um, umami. Um, but for salty, the sodium in the salt, NaCl is sodium chloride, is table salt. The sodium in the salt is actually going to physically be activating these chemoreceptors on our tongue. Okay, so the chemicals would just be, again, the ions, the same thing that we've been talking about before. Um, and then nociceptors are sensitive to pain-causing stimuli. Okay, so if we have extreme heat or extreme cold, things that are outside of the range for our thermoreceptors, they'll activate um, nociceptors. Excessive pressure, again, if it's kind of outside of the range for our mechanoreceptors, it'll activate the nociceptors. Um, and then different inflammatory chemicals. So again, normally chemicals would activate chemoreceptors, um, but some of them are outside of the range for those, and they would activate nociceptors as well. Um, and actually, chemoreceptors, we talked about how they are involved in taste. Um, one, I guess, caveat to that is that spicy foods are actually tasted by nociceptors. So there's a chemical called capsaicin in um, spicy foods that are um, activate these nociceptors. So our, you know, our when we taste something spicy, it's actually just tasting it's your pain. It's painful, but we like a little bit of pain. Okay. The next way we can classify um, the receptors is on location. So these are based on location. 
We have extero scepters, which are responding to stimuli that are outside of the body. So touch, pressure, pain, temperature, um, most special sense organs. So we have general senses, which is just um, like the touch, temperature, that's general senses. senses. Special senses is like um, hearing, seeing, tasting, all of that stuff. Okay. Interoceptors. Respond to stimuli arising in the internal viscera and blood vessels, so inside of our internal organs. Sensitive to chemical changes, tissue stretched, and temperature changes inside of our body. Sometimes we can sense that these receptors are working. You can feel like a little bit of discomfort. But usually in our day-to-day -day activity, um, we're unaware of the workings of these interoceptors. Okay, so what... We are constantly are monitor, monitoring our um, blood pressure with these interoreceptors, uh, monitoring our you know digestive organs, how food's passing through, being digested. Um, so we're not really aware of that unless there's like a major change, um, a fever, or if you have a something upsetting your stomach, a stomach ache. Those would um, feel that, and then finally proprioceptors. Respond to stretch in skeletal muscles, tendon joints, ligaments, and connective tissues. Um, and they inform the brain of one's movements. Okay. So those would be inside of the body as well, but specifically in those skeletal tissues. Um, and just informing the brain of where your body's at in, um, in space. Okay. And then the last type of categorization we can have is um, categorizing based on like the structure of the receptor. So we have simple receptors of the general senses, um, and these typically are going to be modified dendritic endings of sensory neurons found throughout the body and monitor most types of general sensory information. So things like... Um, touch, temperature, all of that would be a general sense, okay? And then our receptors for special senses, like I mentioned earlier, would be things that are involved in vision, hearing, equilibrium, smell, taste, okay? These are going to be housed in complex sense organs, so your eyes are complex sense organs, your cochlea within your ear are sense organs, um, and these we're not going to be getting to, they're in chapter 15, um, but there's, those are the two categories, again, just based on like the structural complexity for the general senses. Um, again, general senses are anything that include tactile sensations. So touch, pressure, stretch, vibration, um, pain, muscle sense. And in these general senses, the receptors are going to respond to multiple stimuli. So you're not just going to have one receptor responding to one function. You're going to see that a lot of different receptors are kind of working together to give your body an idea of um, what's going on in the external environment. Okay. So for these simple general senses receptors, we can either have non-encapsulated free nerve endings or encapsulated nerve endings. Okay, and we'll talk about types of each of these in a second here. Okay, so non-encapsulated free nerve endings are very abundant in the epithelia and connective tissue. So we saw those in the integumentary system. Most are non-myelinated, small diameter nerve fibers, and their distal terminals have knob-like swellings. Okay, so you'll see um, when we saw these in our skin... The end of them have these kind of knob swellings. They're kind of just little like that. Um, and they respond to temperature, pain, or touch. Okay, so there's a few different types of these that you'll see. And they're going to look a little bit different depending on what type it is. But these are all those non-capsulated or free nerve endings. So 
the first type would be our thermoreceptors, our non-encapsulated. So there's cold receptors um, located in superficial dermis that feel cold temperatures. Heat receptors are deeper in the dermis. They feel hotter temperatures. And again, I mentioned before, but for outside of the range for those thermoreceptors, no receptors are going to be activated. And it interprets these extreme um, temperatures as pain. No receptors are also non-encapsulated free nerve endings. They're the pain receptors, again, that are, can be triggered by extreme temperature changes, things like pinches, or release of chemicals from damaged tissues. Okay. Um, I'm not going to ask you specifics about this, but there's this vanilloid receptor is a protein in the nerve membrane that is um, a main player in these nociceptors. It acts as an ion channel that's opened by heat, low pH chemicals like that capsaicin and red peppers. And these different chemicals or heat, when they open the ion channel, it will create um, an action potential, right? A depolarization. Nociceptors, there's also ones that are considered itch receptors that are triggered by chemicals such as histamine. Okay, Tactile or Merkel discs, we saw those in the integumentary system, function as light touch receptors. And they're going to be found in the deepest layers of the epidermis. And then finally, last non-encapsulated free nerve ending would be hair follicle receptors. These are going to be free nerve endings that wrap around our hair follicles. Um, and they also act as a light touch receptor, um, but that are activated by our bending of hair. So if you feel like a mosquito landing on your skin, or even if someone brushes up like against your hair on your arm and you can feel that, it's because of these hair follicle receptors. Okay, And these are, um, again, free nerve endings that are just wrapped around the um, ends of our hair. Okay. So here is a kind of images showing all of these um, and talking about their different um, location, what they do. So I just put this in here so you had this to reference back later. And then the second type um, we, of receptors we're going to have are the encapsulated dendritic endings. Okay. Most of these are all mechanoreceptors. And the terminal endings, instead of just being kind of like a free nerve ending like what we saw before, instead of that, we typically are going to see connective tissue kind of wrapped around um, the end of our neuron, okay? And mechanoreceptors, again, are going to feel changes in like a physical pressure, touch, vibration, stuff like that, okay? So there's um, a few different kinds you need to know. Tactile or Meissner's corpuscles, some of these we've talked about in the integumentary system, are small receptors involved in discriminative touch found just below the skin, are most sensitive in, um, mostly in sensitive and hairless areas, so areas like our fingertips that, again, we need to have that discriminative touch where we can feel um, more precise, detailed what we're feeling. Uh, lamellar or pacinian corpuscles are large receptors that respond to deep pressure and vibration. Um, and only when it's first applied. Okay, So if you have a constant vibration, I don't know, on your skin, these pacinian corpuscles will respond at the beginning, but then they'll stop responding. And then they'll just be turned off, okay? So they kind of become accustomed to um, constant pressure or constant vibration. And these are found in the deep dermis, okay? We also have bulbous corpuscles or Ruffini endings that respond to deep and continuous pressure, okay? And these are also in the dermis. Muscle spindles are spindle-shaped proprioceptors that respond to muscle stretch. So these are actually going to be within our muscle um, fibers that are feeling just like the stretch of our muscles. Tendon organs are proprioceptors located in tendons that also detect stretch, like muscle spindles, but in tendons, not in muscles. 
And then the last type of encapsulated dendritic ending is the joint kinesthetic receptors. Those are also proprioceptors that monitor joint position and motion. Okay. So again, here's just kind of a showing you all of these. Okay, see so these are all going to be encapsulated, so they're going to have this connective tissue kind of around the end of them. Okay, and muscle spindles, again here, we're within the muscle, and these spindle fibers wrap around the muscle fibers, which is kind of cool. Okay. All right, so that's our, um, you know, types of sensory receptors. And again, sensory processing um, our survival depends on not only just sensation or being aware of changes in the internal and external environment. Again, internal because inside of our body, we need to have sensation to feel if we're full, um, to sense our um, blood pressure, our, uh, you know, all those internal processes. But perception is really important as well, which is the conscious, conscious interpretation of our um, stimuli. Okay. We talked about it in chapter 11, but our somatosensory system is part of our sensory system um, that serves the body, wall, and limbs. And it's going to be what's involved in actually sensing and um, perceiving sensory information. So it receives input from all of the different receptors, no matter where they're at in our body. So exterior receptors, proprioceptors, and interoceptors. Our input is relayed towards the head, right? Because we're going from our PNS in the periphery to the central nervous system, our brain and spinal cord. But it is also processed along the way. Okay, so the sensory information doesn't necessarily always have to wait till it gets to the brain to be um, processed. Okay. So there's a few different levels, three levels of neural integration in sensory systems. And we'll talk a little bit more about what's happening at each of these. But the first is the receptor level, right? Which is obviously just going to be our sensory receptor um, out in the periphery. Okay, which can be any type of the receptors that we just talked about. A joint kinesthetic receptor, muscle spindle, a free nerve ending, thermoreceptors, yada, yada, yada. Then we can also talk about processing at the circuit level. And the circuit level is in the ascending pathway. So as the information is traveling up to the brain, that's considered the circuit level. And then our perceptual level is processing in the cortical sensory areas. Okay, so as the information travels up to the brain, it's going to go through our brain stem, so our reticular formation, pons, medulla, into our thalamus. Remember, everything goes to our thalamus before being sent to proper areas in the brain. Once the information actually reaches our somatosensory cortex, um, then we reach the perceptual level. Okay. So let's talk about each one of these. So processing at the receptor level, obviously, is just going to be the process of generating a signal. For, so for sensation to occur, our stimulus must excite the receptor, okay? Which, obviously, that's the whole point of having a receptor, okay? And the action potential then, obviously, will be transmitted and has to reach the central nervous system um, before we have a perception of that stimuli, okay? Obviously, our stimulus energy must match the receptor specificity, so things like touch receptors aren't going to respond to light, but our um, photoreceptors in our eyes, our retina, are sensitive to light. Okay, so again, we need only certain types of stimuli to activate different receptors. So our chemicals aren't going to activate our touch receptors, or light's not going to activate our touch receptors. So we need to make sure the stimulus energy matches the receptor specificity. The stimulus must be applied within the receptive field. Okay, so if we have a, let's say this is our skin, and we have a sensory receptor, say this is a thermoreceptor coming up, the receptive field is the area 
that that sensory receptor is going to um, work. Okay, so if this is a thermal receptor, and say we have um, a cold stimulus that's being over applied over here outside of the receptive field, we're not going to be able to feel it, right? Because we have our, our sensory receptor over here. This is a receptive field. This sensory receptor is only responding to stuff within its receptive field. Okay, we might have another sensory receptor for cold over here. <laughs> We most times will, unless some per the person has some sort of nerve damage or something, that will be able to feel that cold because it's in within its receptive field. Um, but again, if someone has damage to some of their sensory receptors, they might not feel um, the stimulus if it's outside of um, the area that their um, sensory receptors work. Okay, we also must have transduction, which is the energy of the stimulus converted into a graded potential called the generator potential in a general receptor or a receptor potential in the special sense receptors. Okay, so transduction is the converting of energy of the stimulus into energy in the form of a graded potential. And then if those graded potentials meet the threshold, then we'll have an action potential and that um, receptor will actually fire. Okay. We also have something within um, the receptor level called adaptation. And adaptation is a change in sensitivity in presence of a constant stimulus. So we talk about different types of receptors. Um, some respond to constant stimulation. Some only respond to stimulation right when it starts. So if a, you have a receptor that is only responding to a stimulus when it starts, um, it would be considered a phasic receptor, fast adapting. So it sends signals at the beginning or the end of the stimulus. Okay. And that's because those receptors are going to adapt, right? Go through adaptation um, to decline in frequency or stop the amount of action potentials being sent. Okay, so as time goes on, if we have a constant stimulation, receptors can adapt to that and stop sending um, action potentials. Because um, some of these receptors are only there to tell us about a change happening. So if we have a constant pressure or a constant vibration, um, we don't necessarily need to like know that that's happening. Our evolutionarily, um, we're trying to, our body at least, is trying to just warn us of different changes um, in our external environment. So if there's a constant stimulation, it's probably not a threat, right? Because if it's happening and we're not getting away from it, then it's nothing we can do about it. So there's no need to use energy to continually tell us that there is um, you know, a constant pressure or whatever. Okay. So examples of phasic receptors are receptors for pressure, touch, and smell. They're going to adapt very quickly. And we also have tonic receptors that adapt slowly or not at all. So nociceptors and most proprioceptors aren't going to adapt. So nociceptors, again, are feelings of pain um, obviously we don't want those to adapt because we want to know if there's a painful stimulus. Um, and if something gets more painful or is continuously painful, it's important that we know that that's painful. Okay. And proprioceptors, obviously our body needs to be able to know where we're at in space at all times. Okay. The next level was the circuit level. So processing at the circuit level. There are pathways of three neurons that conduct sensory impulses received from receptors up towards the appropriate cortical regions. Okay, so there's going to be first order sensory neurons, second order sensory neurons, and then third order sensory neurons. So you're always going to see these three neurons working together. First order conducts impulses from the receptor. Um, to the spinal reflexes, which we'll talk about later, or to the second order sensory neurons. Second order sensory neurons are just transmitting impulses to the third order. 
And then the third order is conducting impulses from the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex. So if I go back I'm to here, you can see we're going to have first order sensory neurons coming in. So say this one synapsed onto this guy. Then we have a second order sensory neuron sending information to the thalamus. And then a third order sensory neuron sending information to the actual cortex. Okay. And depending on the type of sensation, it might follow a different pathway. But typically you're going to see three um, sets of these um, sensory neurons. Okay, and then at the perceptual level, so within the cortex, um, processing obviously is going to still be happening. Whoops. And this is the interpretation of sensory input, um, and it's going to depend on specific location of target neurons in the sensory cortex. Okay, so again, we're going to have that sensory homiculi, which has the map of our body, different areas that different types of sensations are going to be sent to. Um, and again, depending on where, obviously in our brain, um, information is being sent, we're going to be able to take that information and process it. So there's a few aspects of sensory perception. Um, so perceptual detection is just the ability to detect a stimulus. So you just know that it's there. Okay, and this is going to require a summation of impulses. Okay, so it's not just going to be like one little graded potential. We have to meet the threshold to send an action potential. And we can actually perceptually um, feel it if we have enough action potentials being sent that um, our brain triggers um, us to think that it's an important stimulus. Okay, our magnitude estimation is about the intensity of the stimulus. And the how we figure that out is by the frequency of impulses. So a stronger pain um, stimulus would have a higher magnitude. And you would you'd be able to determine that because there'd be more impulses sent from a more painful stimuli compared to a less painful stimuli. Okay, and then the last um, aspect here is spatial discrimination which is identifying the site or pattern of the stimulus, so where um, this stimulation is actually happening in our body. And we can study this using the two-point discrimination test, which I believe you're doing in lab. Maybe not with lab online, but typically we would do it in lab. Okay. We have feature abstraction, which is the identification of more complex aspects um, and sem several stimulus properties at the same time. So figuring out what you're actually feeling. Um, if you can feel something that's smooth, you can feel that it is round, um, being able to use that and figure out what is going on. <laughs> Quality discrimination is the ability to identify submodalities of a sensation, so sweet or sour tastes, um, different colors. If we we're seeing a red color light versus a green colored light, that's quality discrimination. So it's submodalities of the same sensation, so taste or vision, um, but different, I don't know, different uh, stimuli within that sensation. And then pattern recognition is the recognition of familiar or significant patterns in a stimuli. So if you're listening to music and you recognize the melody, um, that'd be an example of pattern recognition. Okay. So that, those are the, um, I guess, types of processing that we have for our sensory information coming in okay next we're going to talk about the perception I should say of pain <laughs> um so again pain you're going to use those nociceptors no noceo that might be spelled wrong um we have visceral pain 
that results from a stimulation of visceral organ receptors. So again, remember visceral organs are our organs like our digestive tract, um, things inside of our body. So f you normally feel visceral pain as like an aching, gnawing, or burning sensation. It's activated typically by tissue stretching, ischemia, chemicals, and also muscle spasms. So any kind of internal pain, um, sometimes it doesn't even feel, it doesn't have to feel like a sharp shooting pain. Um, but if you have like a cramping, aching feeling, that's considered visceral pain. We can also have an interesting type of pain called referred pain which is when pain from one body region is perceived as coming from somewhere else, okay? And this happens because both visceral and somatic pain fibers travel along the same nerves. So sometimes our brain can kind of mix up the information and assume that their stimulus is coming from um, the same region, okay? So, for example, um, our sensory information from our heart is crossed over with the sensory information from our left arm. So a lot of times when people are having a heart attack, because it's kind of weird to feel pain in the heart, that's not like a normal thing your body is used to feeling. So our brain processes that information and thinks, okay, well, it's crossing over from where we're also getting information from our left arm. So that pain must be coming from our left arm. So we physically feel we perceive pain in our left arm, even though there's no pain there. Um, our mind can kind of play tricks on us, and we have this um, perceived pain, even though there's no pain actually occurring there. Just kind of cool. So that's referred pain. Um, we have obviously just normal pain throughout our body, um, but we can have long-lasting or intense pain, um, such as things from a limb amputation can lead to what's known as hyperglasia, which is pain amplification, um, chronic pain, so pain that doesn't go away, and then something called phantom limb pain, which is really cool. This is one of my favorite parts of this chapter. Phantom limb pain um, is pain that's felt in an area that has been amputated. Okay, so for example, if someone had their left arm amputated, um, they might still feel pain in that arm. And that's considered phantom limb pain because they just don't have, you know, an arm, but their brain is still perceiving pain in that area. Okay. Um, now they find, they're finding that they use epidural anesthesia during surgery. It can reduce phantom limb pain, um, but it can still happen, and there's a lot of different treatments for it. Um, basically, this happens because the individual, even though they get their arm, let's say their left arm amputated, they still have the area in their brain for um, in the somatosensory cortex for feeling in that left arm, right? Because there's a brain area region dedicated to feeling left arm sensations. So even after the limb has been amputated, there's still the area of the brain. So if that area of the brain becomes activated, then they'll feel a sensation, oftentimes pain, in that body area, even though they don't have it anymore, okay? And if you have, because remember we had our motor homiculus, so say the arm pain region is over here, and it's next to, say, the, um, I don't know, the trunk, our body's trunk region here. So say our trunk region is activated, someone tickles your trunk of your body. Because it's close to the arm region, some of those neurons might accidentally excite that arm region as well, and then you'll feel a sensation in your arm. It's kind of interesting. Okay. So that is our pain, again, using nociceptors. Um, so we talked about our sensory receptors, the way sensory information is going to travel um, to our brain. Um, and then the next bit we have to talk about here are our nerves. Okay. 
Nerves are the cord-like organ of our peripheral nervous system. They are made up of bundles of myelinated and non-myelinated axons enclosed by a connective tissue sheath just to kind of hold it all together. So all the nerves are in our body is just, again, bundles of axons. Um, and they can either be spinal nerves coming off of our spinal cord or cranial nerves coming off of our brain. And the name of them is just based on where they're originating from. Okay. Most nerves are going to be a mixture of afferent and efferent fibers. So have both sensory and motor information. And again, they're going to be a mixture of somatic and autonomic or visceral fibers as well, which is again what's kind of leading to referred pain and like heart attacks. We have our visceral fibers from our heart and our left arm somatic fibers kind of crossing over. Um, and our nerves are going to be classified according to the direction that they're going to be transmitting impulses. Um, so we've talked about this a little bit before, but we can have a mixed nerve that has both sensory and motor information, afferent and efferent, which means impulses travel both to and from the central nervous system. We can have sensory or afferent nerves, which carries impulses towards the CNS, right? Sensory information coming from our body towards the central nervous system. And then motor or efferent nerves traveling away from the CNS, right? After our brain in integrates information, sends motor response back out, that motor information comes from our brain and leaves, goes away from the central nervous system. Okay. Pure sensory or pure motor nerves are rare. Again, most of them are going to be mixed. Um, however, are some of the cranial nerves, so our spinal nerves are all mixed, okay? Cranial nerves is where you'll see we might have a few only sensory or only motor. Some of them are also mixed as well, but all spinal are going to be mixed. And again, we can classify it even further if we look at what type of information is being carried. So we can have somatic afferent um, which is sensory information from muscles to the brain, or visceral afferent, which is sensory information from organs to the brain, and somatic efferent, motor from brain to muscle, and visceral efferent, motor from brain to organs, right? So as long as you know what somatic versus visceral is, and then efferent and afferent, that's pretty straightforward. All right, so now we're going to talk about all of our nerves. You're going to spend more time in lab going through this, so I'm going to kind of just skim through. Um, but we have our cranial nerves. Again, they are associated with the brain. Two of them attach to the forebrain, but the rest are at the brain stem level. Okay, um, each one's numbered 1 through 12 using Roman numerals and named from rostral to caudal, so it kind of follows, um, it's in order on where they're leaving your brain. And there's a lot of different mnemonic devices um, to remember the order of these. I'm sure Zach and Lab's going to go through some, um, but the first letter, if you remember a fun little saying, on occasion, our trusty truck acts funny, very good vehicle anyhow or oh once one takes two takes the anatomy final very good vacations are heavenly that's one's silly i didn't write these <laughs> um, but if you remember these little sayings you can remember the order of the cranial nerve so olfactory is number one optic ocular motor trochlear trigeminal abducens facial uh, vestibular cochlear glossopharyngeal Vegas and our accessory. It's missing one. Hypoglossals at the end. Anyhow, maybe H. <laughs> Anyways, if you have these mnemonic devices, it helps you remember the order. Okay. So here is a list of all the nerves, their numbers, their sensory functions, their motor functions, and if they have 
um, parasympathetic fibers or not. Okay, um, so you can take a look at that, study those. But going through them, I'm just going to, again, quickly skim over these because, again, Zach and lab is going to take more time. So number one is our olfactory, which is a nerve of smell. You can read the rest of that. It's a purely sensory or smell function. Okay. Number two is our optic nerves, which arrive, arise from our retinas. They're purely sensory. They have a visual function. The optic nerves cross over at a spot called the optic chiasm, um, which again, we have the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is uh, responsible for um, setting our circadian rhythm, our sleep-wake cycle, that gets light information from these nerves. Number three is our ocular motor nerves. Um, they function in moving the eye, so ocular motor. So raising eyelid, directing eyeball, constricting our iris, which is technically a parasympathetic function, and controlling the shape of our lens to help us focus. Number four is trochlear. Um, they are primary motor that directs the eyeball. So again, movement of the eye, but this time, um, you know, moving the eyeball itself, not just the uh, retina or the iris, excuse me. And lens. Number five is the trigeminal, which is the largest cranial nerve. There's three divisions of it actually. You have an ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular that goes to different places in our face. Um, it mostly can carry sensory impulses from different areas of our face, so it allows us to feel our face, but also has some motor function that helps in mastication, which is chewing. Cranial nerve six is the abducens. Primary motor nerve, it innervates the lateral rectus muscle, um, which is a muscle in our eyeball that allows us to move our eye. And it actually abducts our eyeball. Our facial nerve, nerve number seven, is the chief motor nerve of the face and has five major branches. So again, um, goes to a lot of different areas in our face. Um, but we allows us to do our facial expressions. Also has some parasympathetic impulses to the lacrimal and salivary glands. It has a sensory function of taste from the back two-thirds of our tongue. Okay. Our vestibular cochlear nerve is nerve number eight. Um, we have mostly sensory functions um, that vestibular cochlea, coming from our cochlea, um, allows us to hear. So our hearing receptors in our cochlea. And then in our vestibular division of our cochlea, it allows us to um, equilibrium, our balance. Number nine is the glossopharyngeal. Fibers from the medulla leave the skull. Um, so motor function is to innervate part of the tongue and pharynx for swallowing. And also parasympathetic fibers to the salivary glands. Sensory fibers, um, so we have taste and general sensory impulses from the pharynx and posterior part of the tongue. Number 10, our vagus nerve. This is the main um, parasympathetic nerve. So it's the main guy in our autonomic nervous system. Um, so this is the only cranial nerve also that extends beyond the head and neck region. So all the other ones that were involved in like taste, ear, hearing, you know, moving the eyeballs, vision, right? So everything that's happening in our head. Our vagus nerve actually goes down has these major parasympathetic fibers, really important that you know that, that help re regulate activity of a lot of different organs, so our heart, lungs, and our abdominal viscera. And we carry sensory information from the thoracic and abdominal viscera, baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, um, and some taste buds as well. Okay, but the main thing is this parasympathetic 
um, motor innervation of the heart, lungs, and abdominum. Number 11 are accessory nerves. Um, they innervate a few different muscles, trapezius and your sternocleidomastoid. And then number 12 are hypoglossal nerves. Um, innervate extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue that contribute to swallowing and speech. Okay, so those are all of our cranial nerves. You do need to know name, number, location, and function. So again, they're named in order of where they're coming from in the brain. So you can see number one is at the front. Number two, our optic nerve, kind of in the middle. You can see the optic chiasm here. Um, number three is the next one back. So one, two, three, four, five. Then we have six. This one's seven, this one's eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, so they kind of go in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, so as long as you can count through those, you'll be good. And then we also have our spinal nerves, right? So these are the nerves that are going to be coming from our spinal cord. And again, all of these are going to be mixed. Really important that you remember that. They're named based on where they're leaving. So we have cervical nerves that are leaving in the cervical vertebrae area, thoracic nerves leaving from the thoracic vertebrae, lumbar, and sacral. And then one really small um, nerve by the coccyx. Okay. Um... So you can see here, so the, the spinal nerves, excuse me, are leaving from our spinal cord, right? So there's our spinal cord. Um, and at the very end of our spinal cord, you'll talk about this in lab, we have an area called the um, conus medullaris, which is the true end of our actual spinal cord. So below that, instead of having the spinal cord that we've talked about before, you have a bunch of spinal nerves just hanging down. That's called the cauda equina. And if you're getting, um, uh, what's it called? Um, epidural, ta they're taking cerebral spinal fluid or something from your back, they're always going to put a needle, if they're giving you some sort of epidural or something, below probably around like L3, um, to make sure that they're sticking the needle in the cauda equina. And because if you stick a needle into the spinal cord itself, you'll damage a tissue. If you stick it into the cauda equina, um, those spinal nerves will just move out of the way. Okay. And you'll talk about a few specific spinal nerves you need to know in um, lab, but I'm not going to talk about their, all of them and their functions here in lecture. Okay, but each spinal nerve is connected to the spinal cord via two different routes. We have our ventral route towards the front, which contains motor or efferent information. Our dorsal route in the back contains sensory or afferent information. Okay, so if I zoom in here. So... Um, this is kind of confusing. The back, so if you can see the vertebrae, the spine of the vertebrae are back here. So you know that this is the dorsal side. So this appeared to be the ventral side. So this, these roots leaving the front would be your ventral roots, right? And the dorsal roots are sensory information coming in the back. Okay, so those would be the dorsal roots. So at this stage, the dorsal roots are sensory, ventral roots are motor. But as you get out past here, the um, roots are going to mix together and make up the entire um, spinal nerve, which is why they're going to be all mixed fibers. Okay. So we have um, spinal nerves obviously going to different areas in our body. We'll talk about in lab, um, some specific ones that you need to know. Um, but we can divide our body into what we call a dermatome. 
okay? Because we have, you know, again, specific, um, what are these called? <laughs> spinal nerves, excuse me, sorry, having a rough day today. Specific spinal nerves going to different areas of our body. So we can look at a dermatome and see all the areas of one body um, that are innervating this area of our skin. Okay, all the areas except for our cranial or cervical one nerve participate in the dermatomes. Um, and these are very helpful for medical purposes because um, if a person has um, no sensory information, you know, say in this whole area, you can determine what um, spinal nerves have been damaged based on what areas of the body they have lost sensation. Okay. The dermatomes do have a little bit of overlap, so destruction of just one spinal nerve most likely will not cause complete numbness in an area, um, but you can see they kind of go in order, so your lumbar 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, again, for everyone it might be a little bit different, but in general, um, this is the dermatome layout that you'd see, which is kind of cool. Okay. Um, so that was all the sensory information. Obviously, motor information is happening too. We've already talked about this. Um, so our peripheral nervous system obviously takes sensory information into our brain. Our brain integrates it, and then motor information is going to come back out. Um, motor information leaves our PNS, um, where our PNS is going to be innervating our effectors. So we talked about um, the neuromuscular junction. Right, which is the junction between our peripheral nervous system axon terminal, right, or axon terminal, the peripheral nervous system, and the motor end plate of our muscle. And you're going to see innervation like this at skeletal muscle that we talked about, but also visceral muscle and our glands as well. Okay, we've already talked about this, but the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is going to be what is released once an action potential comes down these motor neurons. Remember, our steps, calcium comes in. Calcium causes the vesicles filled with acetylcholine to be exocytosed. Acetylcholine diffuses across the synapse, binds to these acetylcholine receptors, um, and causes a graded potential within our effector. Okay, and acetylcholine esterase breaks down the excess acetylcholine in our synapse. And the very last bit that we're going to talk about today then is our reflex arc. So you're talking about this in lab as well in more detail, um, but you do need to know the components of the reflex arc and kind of be able to describe it. So obviously in a reflex arc, you're going to have a receptor, which is where your stimulus action is going to be um, activated, right, out in the periphery. Then you're going to have a sensory neuron taking sensory information into the CNS, an integration center within the central nervous system it can be either monosynaptic or polysynaptic, which means there's one synapse or two synapses or many, this could be more than two. After integration happens, you have the motor neuron carrying efferent impulses away from the CNS towards the effector organ. And then the last bit of the reflex arc is the effector, right, which you're going to have um, a muscle fiber gland, can be a, a skeletal muscle or a smooth muscle, and the effector is going to have, do something. <laughs> okay. Again, we can classify um, our reflexes, somatic reflexes, obviously compared to autonomic or visceral reflexes. Somato somatic reflexes activate our skeletal muscle. Autonomic or visceral reflexes are going to activate our visceral effectors, so smooth or cardiac muscle um, or our glands. Okay, but they're all going to have the same um, components of the reflex arc. Just obviously the effector is either going to be somatic, muscle, skeletal muscle, or visceral, smooth cardiac muscle, or a gland. Okay, so you're going to talk about it in lab a little bit more. 
But if this is our spinal cord, I just want to walk you through um, our reflex arc. So again, we can see, you learned this in lab, our dorsal root ganglion. So we know that this is the dorsal side of our spinal cord. So this would be our ventral side. So sensory information, we're going to have a receptor out in the periphery. Okay, sensory information is coming in through the dorsal root, coming into the dorsal horn. And then we can have uh, interneuron within the spinal cord, integrating the information. And then the motor neuron leaving our ventral side and synapsing onto um, our effector out in the periphery. Okay. And our sensory neuron cell bodies are housed in this dorsal root ganglion. Hopefully you learned that in lab. So receptor, step number one, our sensory neuron coming in through our dorsal root, synapsing onto our interneuron within the spinal cord itself. And then our motor neuron leaving um, from our ventral horn, the axon going out the ventral root and synapsing onto an effector at the neuromuscular junction normally out in the periphery. Okay. So these spinal reflexes occur without direct involvement of higher brain centers. The brain is still going to be activated or advised that this stuff's happening. You're going to be able to, you know, the information is still being sent to the brain. Um, but these reflexes allow us, our bodies to respond quickly. Um, so it doesn't need to wait for the brain to integrate the information to respond. Okay, but the brain is still getting that information. Um, it's not just stopping at the level of the spinal cord. Okay, and these reflexes are just really important um, clinically to assess different conditions of the nervous system. Um, so some people could have exaggerated, distorted, or absent um, reflexes, and that can indicate some sort of degeneration um, or a pathology of specific nervous system regions. Okay, so you'll see stretch reflex tests, flexor, and then also superficial reflexes, um, which we're not going to talk about in very much detail here. But you'll do these different tests to make sure that the nervous system is functioning properly, so like the patellar tendon test or the Budbinski um, reflex test. Okay. All right, that is it um, for Chapter 13. If you have any questions, let me know.